Welcome again to the Kitchen of the Celtic Cater. I'm Chef Eric and Fry. And who's ready for some great Celtic cooking today here? Well, we're going to be doing a little bit something different. Or if you've been to any of my demonstrations, one of the old favorites that everybody really likes. It's a Welsh rarebit. And it's actually as we're getting out of the cold, uh, out of the hot season, getting into the more of the cold season. This is one of those nice dishes. And you're also going to notice that this is kind of a dish that was one where you might recognize a little similarity to some, to some American foods, and we'll talk about it in a moment. So Welsh rarebit, and this is out of our vegetable, vegetarian Celtic cookbook. We also have a different variation of it in our Welsh cookbook. Remember, if you like what you see here, go to theCelticCater.com, uh, or go to the YouTube page, The Celticator and Chef Eric McBride, or our Facebook page, The Celticator and Chef Eric McBride, for any of our other updates for it all. So, as we're gonna begin, I'm gonna take some Kerrygold butter, some good Irish butter for this dish, some good Celtic butter here. We want that European butter. It's got a little bit more of sea salt that makes it, a, and it's a crystallized tile. That's totally very, very, very much different than American butter, as well as other things that you've always heard me tell about it. So we're gonna go and I've already melted out some butter here. We get that heated up again here. We're probably gonna add just a little bit more butter into what we're wanting to do. We want this extra milk fat butter, which is what Kerrygold butter has compared to normal American butter. And as we melt this out, we're gonna go and take some onions here. Not much, probably a small onion or maybe a half an onion or so. And at this time we want to go and saute the onions out. So if you have some people that I do know of um, in our audience tonight today, uh, people who are not the biggest fans of onions or so, it's mostly because of the hard oils from a raw onion. I had the same problem when I was uh, uh, out of college or so, kind of got <laughs> abuse of, uh, of the use of onions for it all. But if you go and cook or saute some onions down a little bit, you're actually reducing down or spreading out the flavor a little bit of what the onion and the oils are, but it's not so potent for everything. So as we get our saute of our onions out, we only need a couple minutes here doing all this, we're going to add in some flour. now. We're gonna make a roux, and if you don't know what a roux is, that's basically when you take melted butter and flour and mix together whole. Now there are many, many different types of roux. A lot of people think it's just traditionally of equal portions of butter to flour. That's not necessarily true. It depends on how you want your roux to be. You can have what's called a brown butter roux, which means you're gonna go and cook the butter to a little bit darker color before you actually add in your flour. In this case, we want a dry roux because we're gonna be adding a lot of other moistures into it. So we want a little bit more flour base to butter. And you're gonna to get to see that here in just a moment. Mix this all in here. A little bit more flour into this. And this is also one that I have learned over the ages of cooking at whether I'm cooking in Montana or in Colorado or in California or Pennsylvania, altitude and humidity, especially humidity of the area will determine how you go in, how much flour to go. In. So we're gonna show you a consistency of what we really want. So we get all our, we want a dry roux put together here. It's gonna be kind of the consistency of this. So you want it to the point where you can still mesh and meld it but it's still pretty, pretty dry, and I've got a very hot pot here, too. <laughs> you can always tell there's somebody who's a chef is when they don't have much feelings. I was out uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, visiting another chef that's actually from Brittany, France, out there. Actually, it's the first time I met him at his restaurant. Really nice food. And a waiter comes out with a dish that was a manicotti dish, you know, braising beef chicken manicotti, and the waiter kind of slipped, and this little porcelain little dish here that had the manicotti casserole dish kind of slide out and I just grabbed hold of it and put it down there. It was super hot, but yeah, he and his wife and everybody said, yep, you're a chef because we don't have any fingertips anymore. So now we've got our roux. The next thing we're gonna add in is how we're going to grow our roux. And how we're gonna grow our roux is a little bit of ale. Now this is one that you do not want to use a micro beer. When you're adding a micro beer to a roux, Microbrews tend to have a little bit more bitter of a flavor that will override and actually dominate the rest of the flavor of your dish from then on. It doesn't matter what cuisine that you want to use with, do not use a microbrew beer 
when you're wanting to go and mix it with the roux. In his case, I normally would like to go and use, I used to use Newcastle Ale all the time. However, Newcastle Ale has recently changed its entire flavor, made it more of a microbrew flavor. Basically what they did was they changed out the hops. It used to be done with more of a British hops, which are very mild. And they're very good. British hops are really good to cook with. And so they went to a variation of a, or, or a more exotic American hop that has that bitter flavor for it all. And again, it's not when you want to flavor. So Guinness is pretty much my standard go-to for a lot of this. And we want to keep the heat going. We're adding in our beer. And you want to just keep mixing this in. And as you're doing this, you're going to grow the mass. The beer, the yeast in the beer, is going to react with the flour and the butter. The fat and the food of the flour. And it's going to grow. And so you're just going to add a little bit more at a time and stir until it's all mixed in. Now, like I said, well, I used to use Newcastle before, and you could use, if you wanted to go and use Harps beer or Bass Ale is another one that's really good for this stuff. It's gonna, not gonna have as dark a color because of that. Because of Guinness being a nice stout that it is, lovely beer, you are gonna have a darker colored roux. So we get this all mixed in. And then we're going to add in our other ingredients. One of the main ingredients we're going to add in really quickly is a little bit of Worcestershire sauce. Now some of you have heard me say this before and tell you what Worcestershire sauce is. Worcestershire sauce is basically nothing more than anchovies mixed with molasses or treacle into a vinaigrette. That's the basis. But some of the back history of Worcestershire is really interesting. It used to be known as fish sauce, obviously since it's made with anchovies got a great flavor for when you mix in with things well when you're back in the day it used to be every single port of call all around great britain and europe used to have their own fish sauces and they got really really bad and really competitive about well portsmouth's wish their sauce is better than cardiff's that are better than up in butterwick and so forth and they got to the point where in the early days you could say of corporate espionage people would end up floating in the in the dock areas because of trying to find out what kind of, uh, what was their secret ingredients. It got so bad, it was kind of like that Sylvester Stallone movie. Yes, now all restaurants are known as Taco Bell. All fish sauces are known as Worcestershire sauce world. So we've got our mix and our roux. You can see now, it's a nice paste. It's larger, it's grown in mass for it all. And so the next thing we're gonna add in is some petite chopped tomatoes. Now I want some of the juice in it, but not a lot, which is the reason why I used a dry roux. And I'm gonna keep some of that juice back because I wanna go in, as I'm saying, consistency of what I'm cooking for. This is a tomato Welsh rarebit. Now, I should have stated this at the beginning. Welsh rarebit, not rabbit. A lot of people wanna constantly read in and write. This is a fully vegetarian cook. We wouldn't cook rabbits and then put the recipe inside a vegetarian cookbook. The word, comes all the way back into the 14th century in Wales, where this is where this originally dish originated for. And at that time, it was just meant for their variation of a fondue. Where normally fondue is Parmesan, done with white wine. So, well, this is done with cheddar cheese and ale. Done with a little bit of herbs and stuff. It's a variation for that. Well, again, also went down to England. And in England, during the 1700s, this was an age where they would start borrowing foods from the regions, but it was kind of a, of the time, not today, but of the day and time as it was, they would go and kind of subject it as being that it's not quite as good as English food by saying Welsh rarebit or Scotch eggs or Irish stew. It was trying to, even though that became far more popular than the food. It was because we're taking, they're borrowing from Celtic cuisine into English cuisine, which is actually closer toward German cuisine. And so you were kind of, it was just a, I was trying to say ours is better, but we still like your stuff that we're doing. It kind of came around though, into the night, in the 20th century, the Welsh population actually took the recipe back and made it their own. And now it's the national dish of Wales. So we've got our 
roux and our tomatoes already mixed in. We're going to add in some of our spices now. Primary spice we're going to be using is a little bit of the Celticator mustard powder. Now, one of the reasons why I we have our own mustard powder, if you do not have this, you could use Coleman's mustard. Ours is um, done with a little bit of turmeric into it. Coleman's uh, does, I think it's like uh, 18, 20% flour base. They pad theirs with flour. Now granted this dish already has lots of flour so it doesn't really matter. It's not going to be gluten free but sometimes you want to go and have a spice that is gluten free and that's what we have with our Welsh mustard powder. You want to mix that in there into our whole dish here and we're going to add in a little bit of our five pepper seasoning. We want a little bit of a heat source in there. You can use fresh grated horseradish if you want to and now we're going to add in our cheddar cheese. Now we're using another Kerrygold product, Irish Doubler. This is a good, it's a yellow cheese, but it's a really good, strong, sharp cheddar cheese. It's very, very important that you use a sharp cheddar cheese. I have seen and I have no restaurants, Irish restaurants all across the United States where they go and end up in using uh, the same kind of mild cheddar cheese they use to put on a baked potato. And it doesn't really work that way because when you put any heat to cheese, you start taking away that craftsmanship. And when you take away the craftsmanship, you end up getting a flavor. So if you're using just a mild cheddar cheese that you would put on top of a baked potato, and then this, you're just gonna have baked tofu. You're not gonna have any real flavor. The sharper the cheddar cheese, the better the flavor for it all. So we're now gonna go and heat up to melt our cheese in here. And you notice that, remember, I held back some of my juices. So this is where I want to add this back in, just to moisten up our dish. Now, if you can go and get a really extra sharp cheddar cheese that's a nice, bright orange cheese, you know, the, the, what we kind of think of cheddar cheese, that will help change your color since we're using Guinness beer and this nice white yellowish uh, cheddar cheese, you're gonna get that flavor, you're gonna get a color like that. So pretty much we are done here. Now you have Welsh rarebit for it all. Now how you would serve this is a couple different ways. Mostly, common way, is you'll go and get yourself some nice grainy, grainy bread. All right, I got some nine grain bread and then a lot of this time of whole wheat grains or so you're gonna get it's nice bread because it's not so it's not got so much sugar into it. it's something you have to watch out on your bread we end up putting so much sugar look on your back of your bread when you get a chance here on where it says sugars and it says two grams plus two grams it's really four grams and then it's per slice of bread so you basically have four grams of sugar is one teaspoon of sugar so you have one teaspoon and another teaspoon. You've already got two teaspoons of sugar. And if you're making like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you have more sugar in your sandwich than an entire can of Coke. It's something much. Now, going back to our dish right here, this is what a lot of people they do is they go and take a nice little rare bit on toast. And we can toast this on or just an open face, sometimes like this, and that would be how it would be served. Kind of familiar it's basically cheese on toast sounds like a grilled cheese sandwich where we've kind of grilled cheese sandwich has kind of evolved after prohibition time in the united states where it was actually quite popular at the time in the united states and it lost its essence when you couldn't have the beer so they just took it all so when you get your tomato and grilled cheese now something else is different about welsh rare bit and stuff up in scotland they love this for a different reason for it all they have, since 1980, there was a huge vegetarian movement that happened. Uh, basically what it is, is a, a story came out that said that Scotland had more heart disease rate than any other country in Europe. This is in the predecessor of the EU. And to combat that, they opened up a more vegetarian movement. Now this wasn't to make and convert people to become vegetarians, though quite a few did. It was to go and actually enhance and get more people to eat vegetables in their diets. And one of the ways they did that, with jacket potatoes or a spud bar. And so what they would do is you would come to a little kiosk, a little thing that would have a table about the size of my table right here, you know, one of those rounded glass case things, and inside it they would have different types of 
stuffing for your baked potato, for your jacket potato. Now, you go to a restaurant, whatever town you're in right now, uh, anywhere in the United States, you're going to be offered the same things. Butter, sour cream, cheese, chives, or bacon bits. If you're in Texas, you might be adding chili into that. And Wendy's is the only other one that'll have a broccoli cheddar cheese. Other than that, that's all your choices. Here in, in, over in Scotland, they're going to have things like cauliflower and a whiskey cheese sauce in a baked potato. An Irish asparagus blue cheese salad in a baked potato. They might have a crab salad in a baked potato, all things. Or they might also go and have Welsh rare bit in a baked potato. Some of you guys got to see where I was going with it. We get a nice little dish like here. Pull back my aluminum flops here. You get a nice big helping of Welsh rare bit. And this is practically an entire meal right here. And garnish it with a little bit of chives or so, and you have your nice little dish, Welsh rare bit in a baked potato for it all. So you kind of see a couple of little dishes. Like I said, this recipe is in our vegetarian cookbook, and I also have a different variation in our Welsh cookbook. Primary ingredients you need to use is mustard powder. Key, key, key ingredient that you need to go to it. And a little bit of a heat source like our five pepper seasoning for it all. So if you have any questions about our dish, why don't you go and contact me at the Celticator and Chef Eric McBride. Come under our Facebook again, or you can get a hold of any of their books and our spices. Check out all our spice lines. We now have 14 different, and there's some spice special differences on there as well at thecelticator.com. I'd like to thank you all very much. And as they say in Gaelic, plonge a fleur till we all meet again. Thank you very much.